evening, everyone, once again. My name is Sam Cho. I'm the director of our Spine Fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Here are my two fellows, uh, Dr. Jonathan Lee and Dr. David Weiner. We are going to present a webinar uh, to you on cervical laminoplasty. We chose this topic because uh, it's highly utilitarian procedure. Uh, but may not be uh, used, utilized widely. So we wanted to discuss indication, surgical considerations, and some of the clinical outcomes. So I'll be moderating this hour. So here is the agenda. We're gonna start out with the history and some of the indications and contraindications, as well as technical pearls and uh, pitfalls presented by Dr. Lee. This will be followed by clinical outcomes and potential complications when you are considering laminoplasty. We'll finish up the discussion with the cases and we'll wrap it up. And that should take us hopefully less than an hour. And uh, Dr. Lee, if you can take over. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, we just wanted to kick off the uh, <clears throat> webinar with a couple questions. So uh, in the past four months, what percentage of uh, posterior cervical procedures that you performed were laminoplasties? Give everyone a couple seconds to answer. And if you have any additional questions or concerns, uh, please use the Q&A chat box, not the chat uh, uh, button, but the Q&A button. All right, so uh, like myself, looks like, you know, a lot of us do a lot of uh, posterior uh, fusions, uh, but maybe not as many. Uh, laminoplasty, and certainly when I was in residency uh, back at Rutgers, we didn't do any laminoplasties. And then the next question is just how many have you done in the past four months? All right, all right, so I've got quite a mix. Very good. So hopefully, everyone, uh, you know, there's a little bit something that everyone can take away from today's talk. Uh, here's our disclosures. And jumping in, uh, so a brief history on laminoplasty. So it was uh, actually first described uh, by Oyama in 1970s as a way to treat uh, OPLL. And the uh, kind of basis of it was to expand uh, the laminar arch. Uh, and at the time, they described it as Z-shaped uh, osteotomy. And uh, by doing so, uh, you would get indirect decompression of the spinal cord. Uh, and uh, in not doing a uh, cervical fusion, uh, you could uh, prevent potentially adjacent segment disease, uh, and you don't obviously have to worry about pseudoarthrosis, so you do preserve motion. Then 82, the French door laminoplasty was described, and this was, uh, you basically have two hinges at the laminolateral mass junction and a spacer uh, at another osteotomy site in the spinous process. Uh, this isn't done as much in the U.S. and what we're more uh, probably familiar with is the open door laminoplasty uh, in which you have a one side, a hinge, and on the other side, uh, a full uh, open door, uh, which is usually held open by either bone graft or some sort of plate. So indications and contraindications. Uh, as we mentioned, the goal of this procedure is largely to expand uh, the laminar arch. And usually you'll be doing this for either cervical myelopathy or myeloradiculopathy uh, in scenarios uh, in which you, know, you have either circumferential compression or you may have something more uh, on the ventral aspect such as uh, multi-level disc herniations. And certainly a lot of these will go hand in hand uh, you know, with, for example, congenital stenosis. And as patients get older, uh, there's loss of the, the disc height, there's facetin uncle over tubal joint, uh, changes as well as ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. Uh, and you can see as this uh, problem continues to kind of spiral on uh, and cause uh, is problematic for the patients. So some preoperative considerations, another way to look at that list uh, that was just pre presented, uh, you have both direct posterior decompression, indirect posterior decompression. Uh, when you get direct posterior decompression, this is again, more of the circumferential uh, stenosis by opening up uh, the lamina uh, things are able to kind of open up. And with direct, those are the most more the pathologies that are anterior uh, to the cord. And we just kind of throw in this kyphosis as a relative contraindication, which will be sprinkling in throughout the talk. Uh, but that's in the sense of, you know, when you do this opening from the back, uh, the cord can then uh, drift uh, back. And if you have too much kyphosis, it kind of tether remains tethered uh, 
uh, over those uh, compressive segments. So in some of you're seeing the patients and preoperative uh, considerations. So one, some of the numbers that people use for low doses is up to 15 degrees of actually kyphosis. Um, so anything up to that, uh, you could still get uh, drift back of the cord, uh, as we said, except for some scenarios with uh, lots of focal anterior compression. We'll go over the K line a little bit later. And then it used to be believed that uh, axial neck pain was a strong contraindication uh, as you know, you are allowing the patients to continue to move, uh, and but then they'll still have all this facet uh, arthritis, which could cause pain. But there's actually been a number of studies, including this one by Mesvin, uh, in which they looked at patients who started out with lower uh, neck pain scores, and they actually found that they then uh, had some improvement uh, of those um, of that pain uh, post-op relief at both six weeks and up to a year out. So. Axial neck pain in itself is uh, not really a contraindication. Some in additional indications, these really follow the route of uh, myelopathy, uh, which you on radiographs, you'll see sp spinal cord compression on MRIs or CT myelogram, facement of uh, the CSF. Uh, you might see signal cord changes, myomalacia. Uh, many papers look at the Japanese orthopedic uh, association score of less than 13. That's a moderate to severe. And the, the thing to remember about myelopathy, as opposed to just pure radiculopathy, is that uh, patients in general uh, will get worse. So to counsel your patients, the majority of them will have some sort of stepwise progression uh, as indicated in the blue line. Uh, others will have sort of a uh, gradual decline and a very small population will have some rapid onset followed by a long period of remission. But the take home point uh, is, and also to your patients, is that things are going to get worse. Some early classification, the neuro classification uh, from the 1970s, really looked at the patient's ability to, uh, to ambulate, so mostly lower extremity, as well as their uh, ability to um, maintain employment. Um, but one of the biggest uh, criticisms, and you know, given that we're talking about the cervical spine, and a lot of that has to do with the upper extremity, that this classification system doesn't really address any upper extremity dysfunction. Uh, and certainly with uh, you know, patients, many of these patients are elderly uh, and they themselves have many medical comorbidities which may prevent them from walking and many of them obviously are not working. So that's uh, one of the kind of criticisms of this venerate classification. So more commonly used is this Japanese Orthopedic Association scoring system out of 17 points. Uh, I'll show the modified version, uh, but this does include, uh, was it then include upper extremity function, uh, obviously the lower extremity function and then included sensory and bladder function. And then uh, Benzel modified this to make it a little bit more, uh, I guess, relevant and applicable in the US where you know maybe chopsticks aren't as commonly used. Uh, and in doing so, uh, they created the severity scale, mild, moderate, severe, and this has uh, prognostic uh, uh, capability as well. Some relative contraindications, uh, you know, even much like in our, <clears throat> some of our uh, total joint uh, indications, but inflama inflammatory arthritis, uh, when you have ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, the potential for continued joint uh, bone uh, fusions or joint changes, pathologies. Uh, dynamics, the instability is a relative contraindication as well. You know, if you might have a patient with a little bit of spondylolisthesis, and the thought there uh, is that with the amount of stenosis when they're uh, either flexing or extending their neck, uh, you're kind of impinging uh, on those on those nerves. But in doing the lamoplasty, once you open up those things, uh, the symptoms that they were feeling as a result of that dynamic instability are almost uh, no longer uh, relevant as you've taken off the, removed the sources of compression. And then sort of anecdotally, this previous history of radiation, uh, here's a patient that we had in the past uh, in which they had uh, radiation prior to their laminoplasty, uh, but subsequently went on to kyphosis uh, as their soft tissues uh, uh, were compromised from the radiation that they had undergone uh, in previous years. So additional relative contraindications talked about kyphosis. Uh, another paper they talked about greater than 13 degrees with the highest risk. Uh, and then if you throw in uh, patients with signal changes, and then you know even with five degrees of kyphosis, they're unlikely to have significant improvement. Uh, 
And then certain things that you can't change, such as spinal canal diameter, uh, if they have congenital stenosis, uh, certainly plays a factor. You can only obviously enlarge uh, the canal, uh, you know, as much as the plate and the bone, uh, the underlying architecture will allow you to. And furthermore, uh, you know, the amount of the mean change in diameter that you're able to achieve has implications on the amount of recovery. So I alluded to this earlier, uh, but the K-line uh, as laminoplasty was initially described for OPLL. Um, and this also takes into account some of that, the, the kyphosis that we just spoke of. But if you draw a line uh, from C2 uh, to C7 uh, down the center of the uh, spinal canal, if the OPLL or compressive lesion uh, does not intersect this line, then it's K-line positive and you could get good results with the drift back of the cord. But if it does intersect, uh, that's a K-line negative. And in that situation, uh, posterior decompression alone uh, may not be sufficient. So some technical pearls and uh, potential pitfalls. And obviously even within our own institution, uh, it's varying, uh, you know, people do things a little different. Uh, so we're trying to present the things that we find overall that have found very useful. Uh, so in positioning, uh, you could, some people use face pads, some people use creatinine tongs. Uh, obviously uh, the, the tongs help with some of the, the facial swelling. And it's up to you if the dealer's choice if you wanna use the bivector traction. So most of the work is done with the patient inflection. Uh, in flexion, the patient's foramen are opened up if you wanna do a foramenotomy. Uh, it unshingles the lamina that helps when you do your laminoplasty and even uh, reduces some of the pressure on the venous plexus so that when you're burning, uh, you don't get as much um, bleeding. Uh, but then it's nice to have uh, that bivector pull uh, to then obtain extension once you've completed your laminoplasty uh, to see if there's any uh, impingement. But if you don't do bivector traction, you can always manually do this uh, or have your assistant do it. And then if you use a scope, uh, things to keep in mind is you don't want the patient too close to the head of the table uh, as the scope can impinge on the H frame. So you can bring them down. But then uh, the other thing to keep in mind is you start to lose some of that vertical pull uh, the farther away you get. So, you know. so things that are very important, you know, it's uh, exposure for a lot of spine exposure is very important in seeing what you're doing, seeing what you're doing safely. Uh, but especially in this uh, scenario, this is a meticulous exposure of uh, this posterior cervical spine is important in preventing a lot of the post-op uh, kind of pain um, uh, and kind of issues with fatigue that patients may experience uh, that sometimes give uh, these posterior cervical uh, procedures uh, a bad name. So the nuchal ligament uh, is a midline fibroelastic septum that radiates from the occiput to C7. If you're doing things in ideal world perfectly, uh, you'll have no bleeding as it's ace vascular. Uh, if you start to veer off the midline, uh, you'd probably muscle uh, and you wanna make sure that you're kind of staying down the center uh, as much as possible. So uh, these are the three kind of muscle layers that I described, the paracervical muscles that ideally you're not uh, uh, getting into as you're making a decision, but the cleaner you can make this dissection on the way down and then repair it uh, on the way back up. Uh, the more we can prevent some of the complications, which we'll describe a bit later. So superficially of the trapezius, the inmate level, the splenius capitis, this one is important, this extensor, uh, as it attaches to uh, C7. And then uh, deeper is actually described as three layers, but the most important muscle attachments are semispinalis surfaces and the capitis, those attached primarily to occiput C2. And these, mostly the intermediate and deep layers, are important in giving this constant maintaining this concept of a suspension bridge, uh, which sometimes the cervical spine is uh, the extensors are described as. So as we said, semispinalis services attaches to C2, uh, splenius capitis uh, attaches to C7, and ways to prevent uh, damaging these or to uh, detaching them is to leave a small cuff tissue uh, at the top end of C2, the call end of C7. And as we said that Failure to do though, failure to repair this later on may result in uh, neck pain, reduced range of motion and progressive kyphosis. So you've made your nice dissection, uh, you've got minimal bleeding, uh, and now you're down to the spine. So unlike a uh, posterior cervical fusion, this is a motion sparing, joint sparing uh, procedure. So uh, you want to preserve the capsular tissue, which we've outlined here in green. 
could use a bipolar or cob over this area. Uh, and really, you don't want you want to minimize your soft tissue dissection as much as possible. Um, so prior to surgery, you want to make sure you know which side, uh, and it's not always there is a side, but which side is more symptomatic for the patient, as that will be your open door side. The other side will be your hinge side. So in your exposure for the open side, you want to take your exposure out enough to fit uh, the plate. Uh, and But if you start going more laterally, you often get bleeding there. Uh, and just as we said, we want to preserve uh, as much soft tissue as possible. For your hinge side, you, know, you need a little bit less exposure. There's a junction at the lateral laminal, lateral mass junction. Uh, this is about at the one third point, but that's about as far as you need on the hinge side. Obviously, these two lines would be uh, contra uh, separate sides. So the next poll question we have is uh, at C3, I routinely perform a laminoplasty, complete laminectomy, or it depends on the situation. All right, put the results. All right, so it looks like we have a bit of a mix, um, but maybe only a smaller uh, portion does the laminoplasty. So for us, we usually do a C3 laminectomy uh, for a number of reasons. So the first reason is that uh, there are some studies that show if you do a laminoplasty here, you may get some autofusion to C2, uh, but in doing so, it also allows you to easier, it's easier to lift the lamina that makes burning your troughs easier. And then in addition, if you have uh, some compression at the C2, C3, and C3, sorry, C6, C7 levels, uh, you can do a dome laminectomy there. This provides some additional decompression. And uh, in addition, uh, without, and not taking down the spinous processes, uh, you do maintain those extensor muscle attachments, uh, which we uh, showed earlier. And then also something that can, we, you could do uh, is you can remove uh, some of the spinous processes of the levels you're doing uh, the laminoplasty. This is useful for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it helps the plate uh, to sit better. Sometimes you just need it uh, to get it on there. Uh, when you then op do the open door, you uh, can imagine that the spinous processes are then uh, facing in a almost 30 to 45 degree oblique angle. Uh, and this would be reduced potential result in a uh, asymmetric pull of extensor muscles as you get healing there, uh, which can then cause pain. And then lastly, those spinous processes uh, may also be just a source of mechanical uh, impingement. So some tips on burrowing the trough. Uh, you want to uh, identify the notch at the laminal uh, lateral mass junction. And then uh, I like to take uh, make two burr pilot holes at the cranial caudal edge. Uh, and then obviously uh, for the trough, you just follow a line, uh, you burr a line down connecting the two dots. And on the open side, obviously you wanna go through both cortices. <clears throat> on the hinge side, you wanna maintain just, uh, you wanna just stay on just burr out just the dorsal cortex, keep the ventral cortex. And a lot of times you get these bleeders uh, from the dorsal branches of longitudinal epidural veins. And you can use uh, things such as bone wax or you know hemostatic agent uh, of your choice if you do encounter that. Uh, and there is some disagreement within some of the tens I've worked with, with whether that, you know, if you'd use bone wax on the hinge side, uh, it could potentially prevent healing, um, but you know, others have also used it. So some potential pitfalls when you're burning the, um, the trough uh, is that uh, this one's a little bit more obvious, but you could have a, a hinge fracture if you burn too deeply into the far side and cortex. Uh, but if you do break your hinge, uh, you know, there's things you can do. There's hinge plates that you can use, or you may pack some bone graft. Uh, so that one, <clears throat> you can certainly, uh, there is a uh, bailout for him. The other one's a little bit harder to conceptualize. So I'm hoping I can capture it here uh, well. Uh, but if you just burr uh, your notch just slightly uh, south of cranial and just north of caudal, uh, you actually kind of miss, I'm going to call it like a third cortex. Uh, and that could make your ability to hinge later on more difficult. And if you really force it, you may then uh, have an iatrogenic fracture uh, of your hinge. So you want to make sure you're creating uh, your burr notches kind of, you know, right at the edges. 
So when you lift your lamp, so now that you've done uh, both sides, uh, usually we do the open side first, then the hinge side. Uh, you want to resect in remaining ligament. You can use a Kerrison one or a, a nerve hook. And then you want to, the name of the game here is slow, steady pressure. Uh, you want to be, make sure you're doing everything safely. So you can put your thumb over the spinous process, uh, kind of slowly push things over. You know, a uh, curved turret to also give you a little bit of force to help also, you know, if something were to slip, you don't want your uh, <clears throat> lamina to, to flop back on the cord. As I said, all of this is just supposed to be slow uh, in, control, in a controlled fashion. Usually you could do one or two layers at a time and just kind of go uh, progressively uh, up as you go, uh, coming back at each level as you get more and more. And then the other thing to be careful is if you, uh, you know, sometimes there's these Hoffman ligaments uh, that you can cause a gerotomy, although it's rare, uh, but just something to keep in mind. So the next question, uh, just for anyone who's uh, still awake, is uh, I prefer to use horizontal lateral mass plates, vertical la lateral mass plates, and then depends on the situation. All right. All right, so it seems like the majority use horizontal lateral mass plates. <clears throat> that's what we do as well. We prefer those over the vertical uh, mass lateral mass plates, and that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, if you place the vertical plate, uh, it's a little bit harder uh, to center, especially if you have someone with small lateral masses. But the main thing is that uh, more on the caudal edge, uh, as the uh, facet joint slopes up obliquely, uh, you risk penetrating that joint and then potentially fusing them, which is certainly not the intention of the surgery. Uh, so <clears throat> we like to use the horizontal lateral mass plate and you hook the plate into the lamina, secure it down to the lateral mass, try to cheat uh, superiorly if you have to. Uh, and then we usually put seven millimeters, five millimeter screws. You can use something, instead of using the drill, you can, sorry, the, yeah, like the vendor of a drill, you can use a one millimeter pencil tip burr just to get your hole started. And as I mentioned, there's hinge plates uh, if you have a hinge fracture on the other side. And then as we talked about earlier, sometimes uh, burning out the spinous processes can also help with fixation and also with impingement. Uh, so next question I have for you guys is for, and now that we've completed our laminoplasty, or it's time to close, you know, high fives all around. Uh, do you routinely do a multi-layer closure below the fascia and then you close the uh, deep cervical fascia? Do you only close the fascia, the deep layers will heal and scar in without issues? Uh, not sure what are you talking about, and uh, no closure. That's what plastic surgery is for. And this is certainly one where I've seen, you know, both kind of uh, at our institution. All right. So about two to one. I'm glad that everyone knows what I'm talking about, and uh, people are certainly closing their own uh, wounds. So as we said, you took the time to uh, dissect the layers out nicely. So on the way back out, we wanna put them back uh, as, as close as we can where we found them. We always ask for thousands of ovicral sutures to do to complete this. And just as a review, uh, the deep layer, the semispinalis cervicis, capitis, followed by the spinous capitis. You can see these uh, nicely on the MRI and also in the kind of the uh, hop until drawing. You have the superficially the trapezius, and this is kind of that deep cervical fascia layer, which is the layer that sometimes people uh, may grab some of a little bit of all of that uh, as their one layer of closure. And really, the way the reason we spend a lot of time doing this, uh, and it does take a fair bit of time to close all these layers, is that you don't want uh, to see this. So, one caveat is that this is a posterior, it's on the posterior neck, there is more tension for the wound to heal. It's not like an uh, anterior neck, which is a little bit more supple. Uh, so you do will often have just a little bit of uh, pulling away of the of the scar, uh, and but it's usually covered by the hair or someone you know collared shirt or um, and whatnot. Uh, but the main thing besides just the cosmetic uh, concern that people may have is that as we said, the muscle there's many muscles that are there, uh, part of the suspension bridge, that whole extensor complex, uh, that as that if that does not heal together. Uh, those muscles kind of uh, move out para, uh, centrally, 
Uh, and then that extensor moment that they're supposed to intended becomes a flexor moment and patients often complain of neck pain, shoulder pain, and, and fatigue. Uh, and that's often, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how good your laminal plastic is, but if they have this problem, uh, they're not gonna like you a lot. Uh, so then for my end, just kind of wrapping up. So there's this, these hybrid constructs as with body spine, it's a little bit of sometimes a la carte. Uh, so if you have patients that uh, also have significant radicular symptoms, you can consider for, for, for raminotomy or ACDF. Uh, this has been also shown to sometimes prevent that C5 palsy with uh, too much uh, true fact, although you won't get as much of this with laminate plastic compared to posterior cervical fusion. Uh, so if you can see uh, easily on, the, uh, on an x-ray, those for, for an anatomy sites. Uh, and then in this patient, uh, they had a previous laminoplasty, but continues to have uh, radicular symptoms. Uh, so then they, uh, we ended up putting an ACDF uh, from the front. And then I'll end with this is, you know, sometimes we have these patients that have a nice T2 to pelvis, uh, and you still need to uh, work on uh, something like cervical spine. So laminoplasty is a nice option to help them maintain uh, some neck uh, range of motion. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Wiener. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lee Dr. for an outstanding talk. And then we'll have Dr. Wiener speak on outcomes and present some cases for us. All right, let me just get my screen shared here. So I'm going to be speaking about the outcomes of laminoplasty and specifically as it relates to uh, comparing laminoplasty and ACDF and posterior laminectomy and fusion. So in general, the long-term outcomes of laminoplasty has been reported to be very safe and um, effective in both the short and long-term follow-up studies. Some of those studies have even shown up to 10 years or greater of maintenance of, uh, of symptom uh, resolution and uh, greater recovery rates have been seen in patients who do not have OPLL versus those that do and when tracking their uh, JOA score. The factors that have been associated with poor outcomes include things like uh, the preoperative duration of symptoms, the severity of their preoperative symptoms, smoking status, impaired uh, gait and ataxia, and age with a cutoff being about 60 years old uh, where those who are over 60 tend to do worse than those who are under the age of 60. When we talk about laminoplasty and ACDF alone, there's a couple of things that are obvious right off the bat, which is the goals of the surgery and what we can get just on the, uh, what, what we're trying to accomplish. So with the laminoplasty being a motion sparing procedure, uh, we're kind of obviating the risk of a pseudoarthrosis because there is no real fusion that we're attempting. Whereas in ACDF, we might get some better restoration and maintenance of our uh, lordosis, uh, but potentially a higher uh, complication profile uh, with any uh, anterior neck surgery, uh, dysphagia, uh, horse voice, and pseudoarthrosis, not to mention, uh, obviously, the dreaded complications of an anterior neck hematoma. When studies have been done to look at uh, the differences between the ACDF and the laminoplasty, um, Many have shown pretty much no difference uh, in the JOA recovery rates between the two groups. Um, and we all know about C5 nerve palsy, which we'll get into a little bit more detail later, um, but the literature has been somewhat split on whether or not um, there is any difference in the ACDF versus the laminoplasty patient populations with this. So in regards to ACDF, um, a couple of key studies have looked at this and compared to laminoplasty in the last few years. So Harari, uh, Liu, and Fang all did studies looking at uh, lordosis angle pre and post operatively comparing uh, laminoplasty and ACDFs. And uh, the lordosis in general had been maintained in the ACDF groups better than in the laminoplasty groups, uh, with the exception of uh, Liu's paper, which found uh, that the findings were uh, not statistically significantly different. When we look at uh, range of motion and uh, the rates of nerve palsy, um, one more study was added to this table to, uh, for, by Song et al. And in general, what we found is that, uh, or what we find is that the range of motion may be better in the laminoplasty group or not significantly different. Um, and uh, the nerve palsy findings were 
kind of all over the map and it just depends on uh, who you read. Some of the studies would have you believe that the rate is actually higher in the laminoplasty group than the ACDF. Some would say it's lower and some would say that it's the same. So it's just, um, it just depends on which study you're reading at that moment, which will uh, guide that complication rate. The most important thing I think is picking the right surgery for the right condition. So you need to know what your patient's primary issue is. Is it an anterior based uh, or ventral compressive phenomenon like an OPLL or a large disc or multi-level disc herniation? Is there any retrovertebral disease or any um, posterior uh, ligamentous hypertrophy or facet hypertrophy? Is there a congenital stenosis? Is there any underlying uh, kyphosis? And congenital stenosis, and you can see in these pictures, is a nice uh, description uh, or a nice diagram of what uh, the different morphologies you might encounter in practice might be. And you need to make sure that you're picking the correct treatment plan for all of these because the outcomes might change based on um, based on your patient's preoperative uh, biomechanical measurements. So always use a customized approach when you're treating these patients. Um, while they uh, generally have similar outcomes, a CDF and uh, laminoplasty, uh, that might not hold true if you've done the wrong surgery for the wrong condition. So again, is the disease more ventral or is it more dorsal? Is there more of a focal disease, a single disc, or is there a diffuse congenital stenosis? Is there a diffuse multilevel disc uh, bulging? Is there any uh, significant retrovertebral disease? What is their overall sagittal alignment? And one of the most important things is, is there any dynamic instability? Because that might prevent you from wanting to proceed with a motion sparing procedure like a laminoplasty. Um, when we look at laminoplasty versus a laminectomy infusion, uh, there have been equivalent outcomes reported in regards to their NERIC scores, the JOA scores, and the ODOM outcome scores. Um, Unfortunately, studies on pain, range of motion, and reoperation rates on the patients who undergo laminoplasty versus uh, the uh, laminectomy infusion are not in agreement. So again, here's a list of uh, studies that has um, come out that have come out recently that have looked at the difference between these uh, two populations. And generally, there's no difference in the JOA outcome scores and potentially some reduced range of motion in the laminectomy group that was not statistically significant. Um, that said, the uh, laminectomy infusion group tended to have an improved uh, neck pain score in one study. But again, it's based on who you read because some of the other studies would sell, have you believe that there's no difference in, uh, in the neck pain and potentially even worse in uh, worse outcomes in uh, yet another one of the studies listed on the right. Um, Long-term preservation of lordosis in the uh, laminoplasty infusion group is not statistically significant when compared to laminoplasty. And some studies have uh, obviously reported increased complications in the laminectomy infusion group that includes reoperation rates or increased reoperation rates. Um, more recently in uh, 2019, a uh, NISQIP database a uh, retrospective review of over 3,700 patients was published in the Spine Journal, and they compared the laminectomy uh, patients, uh, laminectomy infusion patients with the laminoplasty patients. And they found that those who underwent a fusion had an increased length of stay. They had more adverse events. They had a higher rate of discharges to rehab facilities and uh, skilled nursing facilities and increased rates of readmission. When it came to the more serious complications, however, including death, pulmonary embolus, DVTs, uh, PEs, and deep and superficial uh, infections, um, there was no difference between the two groups. And so the take-home message when comparing these two procedures, laminoplasty and laminectomy infusion, is that there's really no strong evidence that's going to tell you there is a difference in the safety or efficacy, in, uh, especially in the larger uh, uh, complication profiles that we just discussed. Uh, both are safe and effective effective and are going to fall on what you're most comfortable with. And uh, again, what's best with the, uh, what's best for the patient based on their disease and their uh, biomechanical uh, parameters. And there's an unclear difference in the literature um, with regards to neck pain outcomes. So most importantly, uh, when deciding between these two procedures, again, is what is their sagittal alignment? 
and is there dynamic instability? Obviously, any abnormal motion is going to likely push you towards a fusion over a motion sparing uh, motion sparing uh, procedure. And sagittal alignment, if you have a patient who has any preoperative kyphosis, as we'll talk about uh, shortly in uh, the complication section, the uh, risk of developing a kyphosis postoperatively from a laminoplasty is real, and uh, that might drive you more towards a laminectomy infusion, even if um, uh, they were not dynamically unstable. Uh, and this is the, the newest data that's out and has not actually been published yet, but this is from CSRS this year, um, looking at laminoplasty versus ACDF versus a laminectomy infusion. This is an ongoing multi-center uh, prospective randomized control trial. This is the first reporting of this uh, across 15 sites. And what they found thus far is that uh, the laminoplasty patients have had superior outcomes when compared with the ACDF patients, that patients undergoing an ACDF or a uh, posterior laminectomy infusion had a greater number of complications one month postoperatively when compared to just the laminoplasty patients. And a larger percentage of patients who underwent a laminoplasty did return to work one at the one month mark when compared with ACDF or the laminectomy infusion group. Uh, that said, by one year, those numbers had uh, come down to a not statistically significant level. So um, you can at least counsel your patients based on this information that if they are candidate for laminoplasty, they should be able to expect a return to work and uh, more normal function sooner than if they had undergone an ACDF or a posterior fusion. Moving on to complications. Um, there are four main ones I want to touch on. Uh, the first thing, C5 nerve palsy, axial neck pain, loss of motion, and uh, postoperative kyphosis. And we've touched on all these briefly, and I want to dive into them a little bit deeper. So uh, C5 nerve root palsy has been postulated to be from a variety of different um, causes, and they've all been associated through one study or another. And those include, and this is not an exhaustive list, but nerve root traction and a tethering phenomenon um, the C5 nerve root uh, does have the shortest uh, distance in the, uh, from the cervical spine to the brachial plexus. And so it has the least amount of give when there's drift back of the cervical spine after a decompression. So um, that's been thought to cause a traction neuropraxia leading to a transient nerve palsy. Another theory that's been postulated is cord ischemia, secondary to decreased blood flow from stenosis due to the radicular arteries during um, traction. So underlying foraminal stenosis, for example, with additional traction during your surgery might lead to some, um, some uh, ischemia and, um, and some uh, postoperative uh, neuropraxia or postoperative radicular uh, symptoms. If reperfusion on the on the flip side of that has also been uh, postulated and uh, associated with uh, the C5 palsy from uh, just once you've decompressed the uh, uh, stenotic canal and allowed blood flow to increase from the anterior spinal artery that um, you could get a reperfusion injury similar to every other reperfusion injury that's seen in, uh, in the extremities uh, or the lower spinal cord. Um, Spinal cord disorder and underlying gray matter pathology like myelomalacia has been associated with this. Um, the actual technique of your laminoplasty and elevating the lamina greater than 60 degrees uh, has been shown or has been associated, I should say, with an increased um, rate of C5 nerve palsy. And then obviously just not being careful with the nerve intraoperatively, surgical trauma and battered nerve root syndromes um, can obviously give you a, a radiculitis uh, regardless of what surgery you're doing. Um, in literature, it's a roughly five and a half percent total complication rate for um, C5 nerve palsy. That's regardless of actually anterior or posterior surgery. Um, and like I said, there are multiple theories. One study uh, that looks specifically at the uh, posterior uh, laminoplasty was done by Jack and Rue and published in 2019, looking at 16 studies. They found in their uh, in their groups, about 6% uh, pooled prevalence of C5 nerve palsy among those papers, and an association between foraminal diameter and cord rotation that was associated with an increased risk. And that makes sense from a theoretical standpoint that if the cord is rotated 
putting an additional traction already on the nerve root that um, in addition to having some foraminal stenosis, you'd be uh, putting that at risk for being an injured nerve. And yet what Rue's follow-up study found was that a prophylactic foraminotomy at that level, at the C5 level, does not, or the C5 nerve root level does not protect against the C5 nerve root palsy. So on the right side here is a diagram from that paper, which showed a 63-year-old uh, female or a 63-year-old patient who had a um, C5 palsy with um, prophylactic foraminotomies that still went on to develop a uh, bilateral palsy of the C5 nerve root. So this generally will resolve within a few months with just conservative treatment, including PT. We're focusing on strengthening range of motion and just observation. A study by Magma showed that about 67% of patients who have this C5 palsy will have a complete resolution by four months on average, although it can take up to a full year. And so it's important to counsel patients that this might be a delayed onset type of a, an injury and that, that is usually the case where it won't happen immediately on post op day one. Um, and if they do experience it, that it should resolve, it just may take some time. Axial neck pain is a large thing that we've talked about tonight um, throughout the, the conversation here. And so I just wanna dive a little deeper. And originally laminoplasty was thought to increase the incidence of neck pain. That was originally postulated in a study in 1996 by Posono et al. Um, in the literature now, the ranges are huge between five and 61.5% of an incidence of postoperative neck pain after laminoplasty. And some evidence has shown that uh, preserving C7 may contribute to um, increased pain post-op as well. So some studies have, have tried to change the technique a little bit to see, is there any correlation between the extensor muscles in the back and preservation of those muscles, as well as pain from uh, impingement after doing the laminoplasty? So the, the C3 laminectomy with a C4 to 7 laminoplasty versus doing a C3 laminoplasty all the way down to C7 was shown to have an improved post-operative axial neck pain. Um, and that's thought to be due to two reasons. The first is that you're preserving the semispinalis surfaces, uh, which has been reported uh, to independently be uh, a cause of post-operative uh, pain when it's dissected off the C3 and especially the C2 um, uh, lam uh, spinous process. But also when you have the C3 lamina, uh, in a laminoplasty lifted up, you are increasing your risk of impingement on the C2 spinous process, which in itself is also a pain generator. So our preference, the senior author's preference, is to perform a C3 laminectomy rather than a laminoplasty if necessary to go up to that level. Um, it does not require a full exposure of the C3 lamina, therefore decreasing the need to dissect off further extensor musculature and do a partial laminotomy of the C7 vertebra also to preserve some of the, um, uh, the posterior extensor musculature. There's also some non-technique factors um, that have been associated with post-operative axial neck pain. Uh, one study by Oshima et al. in 2019 uh, looked at post-operative neck pain in regards to the uh, mental component summary score. And what they found was that if you had uh, female sex, uh, presence of uh, preoperative neck pain, a low postoperative physical component summary score um, and low or low satisfaction with treatment that you would have an increased risk of developing or having postoperative axial neck pain. And postoperative mental component summary score was an independent risk factor uh, for the development of postoperative neck pain as well. So it may not be anything that you can change technique wise. It may just be that this pain is in a certain population of patients and we have no control over what's gonna happen with uh, their post-operative pain course. One more thing to consider is the original article I discussed, which is Hosono et al. Uh, had reported an incidence of neck pain that was higher in laminoplasty when compared to the ACDF group. Uh, and this is again, back in 1996 and they found a 60% versus 19% uh, rate of pain for laminoplasty versus the CDF. What the most important thing to consider here is that those patients had a rigid cervical collar on regardless of their treatment for two to three months. And so there are a subset of patients who will have disuse atrophy uh, 
in their extensor musculature postoperatively and have some deconditioning. And that in itself could be a, um, a, a risk factor for continued postoperative neck pain if you can't hold up your head in a comfortable position and maintain your center of uh, gravity very well um, if you had disuse atrophy. So that's something where some patients might actually benefit from just prolonged physical therapy postoperatively if they needed any immobilization for, for various reasons uh, to see if they improve before deciding that they need uh, additional intervention. Loss of motion um, is another thing that uh, came up a couple of times in our talk. So interlaminar bony fusions occur in approximately 28 to 88% of patients who undergo laminoplasty. This occurs most commonly at the C2-3 level. Um, and you can see on the right here is a great example of the progression of this development of a C2-3 uh, autofusion or bridge. And that can be for uh, a variety of reasons, but the impingement is a, is a significant uh, generator of this. When you do the C3 laminoplasty, you have an open edge of lamina, essentially a, a fractured bone that's going to be constantly in contact with that C2 spinous process that can lead to the development of this autofusion. Um, so even though it's a motion sparing procedure, there is obviously a risk of loss of motion. Um, additionally, the disruption of your posterior cervical extensors and improper closure that uh, John had uh, spoken about earlier and making sure you have a meticulous posterior closure can uh, lead to a loss of motion. And like we said before, the interlaminar fusion between adjacent open lamina um, and the uh, C3 and C2 impingement. Uh, what's also important to note here is that the posterior cervical musculature and the semispinalis are acting as extensors, but when they're not closed properly and they splay off of midline, they actually turn into a uh, flexor. So you have trouble maintaining your head extensor, even as you try and fire those muscles more to maintain your head in more extension, you're actually flexing your head more and end up putting more strain across those muscles leading to more axial neck pain and obviously then a loss of motion or a, um, or a postoperative kyphosis that we'll discuss next. So loss of lordosis, um, there was a paper that came out in Spine in 2016 by Sakai et al. And they postulated that the center of gravity of the head to uh, the C7 uh, sagittal vertical axis is an important predictor of the development of postoperative kyphosis. They looked at 174 patients with a preoperative lordotic alignment and found about 5.5% developed a kyphosis postoperatively at one year. Uh, all of those patients had an inferior clinical outcome via the by JOA measurement. And what they found is that the predictive factors were age and their preoperative cervical sagittal imbalance. Um, if you look at this graph here that they created, you can actually, uh, you can actually quartile your patients um, by age and then um, determine their risk of developing a kyphosis based on their preoperative imaging. So if they, as you would expect, if they're very old and they have a huge C7 sagittal uh, vertical axis, they have almost 100% risk of developing a postoperative uh, kyphosis. Whereas if they're young, or in this case 70, and only have a four centimeter uh, C7 uh, sagittal, sagittal vertical axis, they have almost uh, only a 1% risk. So uh, you can stratify your patients based on this and use it to guide your decision. Again, not that we're not trying to say that laminoplasty is the only procedure you should ever do, but that it may be the wrong procedure in a certain subset of patients, and this would drive you towards a different procedure that might be more fusion or correction of their underlying kyphotic deformity. In general, the postoperative kyphosis is associated with poor outcomes. Uh, most of the extension moment is generated from your semispinalis surfaces, as we discussed in that, becoming a flexor. And it, the loss of lordosis does seem in some part to be dependent on preserving the dynamic stabilizers. And why we found that when you preserve the C3 and C7 attachments, um, and C2 attachments that you have a lower risk of, uh, or a lower chance of postoperative neck pain and, uh, and failure of your construct into kyphosis. So the take home message here is please preserve all the muscle attachments through a meticulous closure. Uh, this is a paper by uh, Izuka that, looks, that explains a cruciate type repair of the C2 spinous process. If you do have to detach the C2 uh, muscular attachments, 
um, by uh, bringing the opposite uh, diagonal uh, muscle attachments back to the spinous process and repairing them down. Um, even with that, some studies have still demonstrated that there can be a loss of lordosis, uh, especially in uh, the female population. So we're gonna move on to a case discussion now. This is gonna be a 59 year old lady with uh, right arm pain that is uh, in a ridiculous fra fashion uh, that's been getting worse for the last three months with worsening ataxia. Pain is about a five out of 10, two out of, two out of 10 at best. Uh, worsened activity when moving your head, certain sleep positions make it worse. And again, worsening ataxia with some clumsiness in her hands and fine motor difficulty, um, no real past medical history. Her exam is five out of five strength, except for the right wrist flexors and uh, grip strength, which is only a four. Deep tendon reflexes are three plus throughout and symmetric. She does have a uh, positive colonus and she does have a positive Hoffman bilaterally. Here are her x-rays. This is showing a lateral x-ray of her cervical spine. We can see that she does have some hypolordosis and maybe even some focal kyphosis at the C3-4 level. Um, there's no flexion extension views, unfortunately, um, but uh, she does have a reasonable range of motion. So we're gonna put up, oh, and here's her MRI showing uh, multi-level cervical uh, stenosis with, again, uh, maybe a focal kyphosis at uh, C3-4. And so we're gonna put it to the group now. What would you do? All right, so kind of gave you what we would do, which was the laminoplasty, obviously. So it seems like we're about uh, two to one uh, with laminoplasty versus a fusion of, uh, or actually one to one laminoplasty versus some kind of fusion. Uh, most people elect to do something from the back. So obviously we proceeded to uh, go ahead with that uh, C, uh, four to six laminoplasty um, postoperatively. She's done very well and uh, is very pleased with her results. We also did a foraminotomy uh, to address her C6 uh, um, radiculopathy at the same time. And uh, I think this is a good case to illustrate that avoiding that C3 level and preserving the attachments, even if she has a kyphotic alignment there, uh, we will hopefully get away without having to do a fusion. This is a patient that did not want a fusion. So um, we'll keep following her for the years, but hopefully uh, knock on wood, she keeps uh, a great result. Well, I think, and you I know, obviously one of the key take-home points is uh, that laminoplasty is one option among several in, in cases like this. And I think it's very important that you talk with your patient and set up the right or appropriate expectations. And this is a very active lady calling from one of the Caribbean islands during the pandemic. And she enjoys water sports and did want, not want a fusion. At, at C34, although there was focal kyphosis, I did not think that, that was, it was a symptomatic level. Um, she had C56 uh, radiculopathy, which we addressed with, with pyramidotomy. And overall alignment uh, is slightly lordotic. So I thought that uh, posteriorly based decompression would suffice. Uh, with laminoplasty and uh, preserve whatever motion she had. She may not be moving that much uh, through those uh, multi-level spondylotic segments as the, you can see that the discs are quite collapsed at multiple levels. And uh, thankfully she did well. Um, and uh, she still enjoys water sports. So I wanna move on and talk about a um... Uh, an application of the laminoplasty technique into the upper cervical um, uh, segments. This is not something that routinely comes in, but uh, it just demonstrates the versatility of this procedure and what um, what you can keep as a, you know, a tool in your tool chest if needed. So this is an 83-year-old male with rapidly worsening myelopathy over the last two and a half uh, months. He's now in a wheelchair due to worsening ataxia, worsening handwriting in the past 10 days and worsening fine motor skills, uh, has not responded to any non-operative therapy, including injections, and uh, does ambulate now with a, uh, uh, does ambulate at baseline with a uh, walker, cane, and wheelchair on occasion. 
Uh, his past history is significant for rheumatoid, psoriatic arthritis, hypertension, and a prior C3 to 5 laminoplasty. Here's his imaging, and you can see what's uh, perfectly illustrated here from one of the complications before is he has a C2-3 autofusion um, at, that, uh, at that level from his prior C3 laminoplasty. So this is not just a reported thing, this is real. This is a patient that we have uh, and followed in our clinic. Um, and he had, uh, uh, has no motion or flexion extension at that, at that level. Um, and you can see he is well decompressed at those previous levels still with some ma with maintained lordosis there, but he's got this large rheumatoid panis at uh, the C12 that's causing uh, central stenosis and uh, displacing this proximal uh, spinal cord and uh, severe uh, central canal narrowing. So we elected to do a um, C1 uh, laminoplasty with uh, C12 uh, screw fusion. So the reason we did this is because if you have to decompress at C1, uh, your choices in our mind were that we would have to fuse up to the occiput, which we did not want to do in this gentleman uh, because of his rheumatoid condition and only having a C12 facet fusion as your main uh, point uh, for bony uh, union, uh, we wanted to have a more robust uh, fusion mass developed. So here we uh, decided- Dave, can you C orient the video uh, for the audience? Yeah, so left is sure. one, right? And then what is the uh, the person, the surgeon doing right now? Sure, so let me pause this real quick, but you can see uh, left is cranial and right is caudal. Um, left is closer to us and right is uh, the top of the screen. Uh, you can see here we have bird our troughs uh, on either side. We're doing a French door laminoplasty technique. Uh, we have uh, put two holes on either of the French door that we will then use to secure a fibular strep allograft that we cut uh, to create more of a bony surface for union, and then divided that centrally um, between the two holes. Here's using an upgoing curette now to gently lift the uh, one side of the French uh, door of the laminoplasty, and now passing an ethibon suture through to uh, to secure our fibular shunt allograft down to the French doors once they're opened. Here you can see us sliding down that, um, that uh, allograft uh, momentarily um, once, we've, once we've freed up all the soft tissue attachment uh, and obviously raised our, our door now on the right side. Of note, we've already instrumented at the C1 and 2 levels so that this was the last thing that we needed to do. Uh, you can see that the cord is very prominent here at the C1 level, which normally you wouldn't expect uh, unless you had an anterior um, uh, compressive uh, lesion or mass like this rheumatoid panis. So here is again that fibular strut allograft that we were able to uh, manufacture on the back table being secured down with the previously passed suture. Now, now where you just go and do a little bit of work with the burr to create the landing spot for our fusion with a, uh, at the C1 arch that's still remaining. And then uh, again, down at the C2 lamina, which was uh, preserved as well. So here we're gonna work just on the C1. And then here we're gonna work on C2 mostly around the screw and then coming a little bit more medial. And then we put down some uh, biologics to help to uh, promote a fusion in this gentleman who has otherwise uh, significantly poor protoplasm with his rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis on treatment and then put down some allograft. And what we see with this patient is postoperatively, he looks great with his uh, instrumentation. Uh, he has preserved uh, C, uh, C2 to C6 lordosis uh, compared to preoperatively. And here's a quick uh, O-arm spin because we wanted to make sure that our instrumentation was appropriate intraoperatively. And you can see our fusion mass there on either side of the spinous process and the open uh, canal with a nice decompression of that C1 
compressive pathology, and then our uh, fibular shred allograft creating a nice bony landing spot in addition to the sides of the remaining French doors that would allow for a better fusion. So to wrap up our, uh, our talk tonight here, the take home message is that surgery for uh, congenital or just cervical uh, myelopathy is really uh, beneficial to patients regardless of your approach, that these patients will do well uh, with surgery if they have the symptoms and we know that they will progress in a bad direction if you don't intervene. Um, tailor the treatment to the problem. The slide has come up multiple times and I think it's maybe the most important take home point. Just like Dr. Cho has said, laminoplasty is one of the tools you can use, but you need to look at what your patient has. Is the disease more ventral or dorsal? What's their alignment? Do they have any dynamic instability? Um, in regards to laminoplasty, it may have benefits over ventral or dorsal fusion if used in the appropriate setting. And more recent data seems to support that, especially in the short-term outcomes, and that the soft tissue closure is absolutely critical to reducing kyphosis and helping with post-operative neck pain. Now I think we'll open it up to some questions if anybody has any. Great, thank you, Dr. Winner. Uh, I think uh, there was a question about the vert, especially with the C1 laminoplasty, and and of course, so you have to be cognizant of the course of the vertebral artery as it travels up into the cranium, and uh, you have to protect it. Typically, we would uh, put a curved curette underneath. Uh, where you are about to burn and make sure that there's uh, absolutely no danger before you even try that. And uh, I would argue that for a C1 laminectomy, uh, you should uh, do that as well. Uh, and, uh, and there was another question about why do a laminoplasty there in, instead of just doing a, doing a relatively simple laminectomy. And uh, we try to uh, expand the spinal canal, uh, but we know that uh, C1 to fusion can be difficult if you have a tiny little bony fusion bed, at, especially at C1. Uh, so we wanted to uh, maximize the bony fusion bed, uh, bed and directly place the bone graft on top of the uh, open door laminoplasty. And also at C1 too, we'd like to decorticate the facet joints. You can uh, definitely access the facet joint uh, right underneath the C2 nerve and protect the nerve and stick a drill and decorticated aggressively, and uh, and you can certainly uh, place some bone graft thereafter. And if in the case of vaginal in vagina, uh, uh, basilar invagination rather, um, you can actually jack up the uh, the C1 to joint uh, by placing a, a bone, structural bony graft or or even a cage if uh, it is uh, mobile, and that can obviate obviate the need for fusing up to the occiput. That's going off the topic a little bit. Hopefully I answered some of your questions. Are there any other questions? So uh, laminoplasty, a uh, very uh, versatile, but it's one of the treatment options. And I think uh, it would uh, be an important procedure to consider uh, when uh, patients are requesting that you not fuse the spine, uh, they want to maintain uh, some certain act, certain activity levels. Um, so uh, with that in mind, we will finish our webinar. Thank you so much for listening in. And I think the AO has some questionnaires that are, that's going to uh, follow for you to answer. Thank you.